I have a question for you. What do we owe to each other? My name is Jonathan Coleman, and I'm a senior design manager at Intercom in Dublin, Ireland, where I manage product designers on our platform and growth teams, along with our design system. But even though I live in Ireland, I don't have an exciting Irish accent. And that's because I'm originally from the United States, the state of Michigan. Yep, it's the one that's shaped like a hand. You can find me on Twitter at Jay Coleman, and if you have questions or complaints, I'm happy to follow up with you there. But look, I know you're busy and multitasking at home, so no worries if you need to leave early to take care of your kids, walk your dog, or go register to vote. You can go to this link right now and get all of these slides. Go.inter.com slash what we owe. That's all one word. And there you'll find the full text of this talk and notes on everything I mention, so there's no need to take notes when we get to the section about the metaphysics of time travel. And I'd love to tell you more, but it feels like we're about to jump backward in time. It's 1999, the end of the millennium. I'm a Peace Corps volunteer in Burkina Faso, West Africa. I'm working in public health education in a tiny village on the shore of the Sahara for about two years. I vaccinate children, create education programs about HIV and AIDS, record health data, and distribute food supplies. And I only work with men. All of the doctors, nurses, school teachers, tribal leaders, business people, everyone in a position of power in my village is male. But the people I really serve are women and children. So the story of the village was far greater than just the people who put themselves in charge of it. And among other diseases, malaria is endemic to Burkina Faso. And the U.S. government gives me a supply of a drug called methylquin to help me avoid f infection, and it works well. I never got the raging fevers or the shaking chills that you might associate with the disease. But there are side effects. Methylquin causes hallucinations, paranoia, and vivid, hyper-realistic dreams. We joke that going to sleep each night is a little bit like going to the movies but we're all nervous about it. Some volunteers in my group had to leave the country because they couldn't handle the side effects. But me, I handle it as best as I can. I take the drug for two years, and I do my job. I serve my country. But there are side effects. When I come back to the US, I find that it was difficult for me to create new memories. You know, kind of like that one guy in that one movie. You know the one. I usually remember the big things, but the little ones often float away from me, or the order that they happen gets sort of jumbled or mixed up. Sometimes I think about the stories I've read and they get jammed into my memories. It sort of feels like I experienced them firsthand. Cause and effect get murky because things are just so out of place, like leaves blowing in the wind. And it makes me feel scared sometimes, but there are some unexpected benefits. It's April of 2019, and my wife is on a mission to take a photo of a door in Dublin every day for a hundred days. We recently moved to Dublin from Seattle, and we spent a lot of time on our feet walking about the city. And it turns out the city is filled with brightly colored doors. They're everywhere. So she's got this great idea about sharing photos of the doors ordered by the colors of the spectrum. And that way, when you see all the photos together, there's this amazing gradient. The story of the doors isn't about their individual hues. It's about how all of those hues work together to show off the city and its culture. So today she's looking for an orange door, and I find one, and I excitedly point it out to her. I'm jumping around, practically shouting about it. I already got that one, she tells me. Don't you remember? We passed it last week and you said the same thing. <sighs> I'm disappointed. I know I've done it again. That same thing I always do. How many times will we have the same conversation, but I won't remember it? It's 2006, and my wife and I are getting married on a beach in New Zealand. She's reading me her wedding vows as the water laps at our feet. She's making me cry. She tells me that she will always be our memory, and even when I forget things, she won't. Our story as a couple isn't about each of us as individuals. It's about how we work together to solve our problems. It's right now. 
And because of the way my memory works, I don't like long talks where you only find out the big message at the end. I lose track of the ideas too easily. They're like leaves blowing in the wind. So I'm just going to tell you the main points right away before I forget them. Men are going through life on easy mode. It's what the author John Scalzi calls the lowest difficulty setting there is. You know, like in a video game. We're going through life on easy mode because we've completely structured society and its underlying systems for our benefit. It's not that we don't struggle. We do, all the time. But for the most part, there's almost nothing structural that holds you back if you're white, male, heterosexual, and abled. It's easy mode. At least as compared with, say, gay woman immigrant of color who's differently abled. Now that is a hardcore setting. And it's not just you, it's me. I'm going through life on easy mode. People who look like this have easier and more access to education, information, work, wealth, and opportunity than just about anyone else. We also have far more unearned forgiveness for our mistakes and failures, not to mention forgiveness for our presumption. For example, a white man giving a talk about gender equity. So listen, there's nothing new here. We all know this. And I'm not saying these things to shame men. I just want to be straightforward about the facts. It's not about shame at all. It's about learning. And that's the other main point of this talk, the need for us to learn. When you're in the majority, you have a sacred duty to do no harm to others and to share all of the benefits you have. Because even a small act of carelessness by the majority can cause tremendous harm to everyone else. So if you're in the majority like I am and you don't take care, then you'll end up hurting so many people so badly that they remain in the minority forever. It doesn't matter if you don't intend it. The impact of your actions is what matters. So I want to challenge everyone, but especially men, to be curious. Use your curiosity to learn, and then use your learning to make things better. And you're going to make mistakes along the way. I certainly have, and I'll share some of them with you today. Just learning about something doesn't mean that you're going to be great at using your knowledge or putting it into action. So one of the things that I hope you take away from this is that you don't have to be perfect. That's because perfection is a myth doesn't exist, and yet we all somehow choose to continue believing in it. The more perfect you try to be, the slower you'll learn, and that means that you won't grow as fast and you won't do as much good as you could. So don't try to be perfect. Instead of perfection, try to stay focused on just making small amounts of progress. Well, that and being as kind as you can to everyone you meet. Now, being perfect doesn't absolve you from taking responsibility for your actions, just like it's not an excuse to quit. And that's it. That's the talk. You can all go home now. Oh, well, I guess most of you are already there. That was fast. It's 2019, and I'm at home too. I'm watching The Good Place on Netflix. One of the characters quotes the philosopher T.M. Scanlon and says, The real question is, what do we owe to each other? What do we owe to each other? As I've become more aware of gender inequity in design and in the world, it makes me curious about this idea of accountability. What should men be accountable for? How are they held accountable by others? And is it possible that they can hold themselves accountable? If so, then what for? It's 1916. Helen Maloney is in Liberty Hall here in Dublin. It's the eve of the revolution. Helen's asleep on a makeshift bed of piled up coats, and there's a hidden revolver under her pillow. She'll put it to good use the next day. Since moving to Ireland, I've been curious about its history, and particularly the role that women played in it. I've learned that the 1916 Rising featured more than 300 women, and, for a time, many of them were subtly erased from history by a scared patriarchy. But once you learn about these women and their stories, you can't forget them. Fiona Plunkett and Muriel Gifford were amongst a group of women who assisted those most affected by the lockout of 1913. They worked in the soup kitchen and took part in food distribution. Kathleen Lynn, an active suffragette, was chief medical officer during the Rising. 
She later founded St. Alton's School for Children with her lover, Madeline French Mullen. Molly Childers, who walked with two canes after breaking her hips as a child, ran guns through Hoth to arm the rebel fighters. Margaret Skinner infiltrated the Beggar's Bush barracks to collect reconnaissance. She was a skilled sniper and the only woman wounded on active service. Kathleen Clark was one of a dozen founding members of Come in the Mon, even though her husband forbade her to take part, and she later became a driving force behind the creation of Sinn Féin. Elizabeth O'Farrell was a dispatcher before and during the Rising. She carried food and ammunition hidden in her dress to the rebel forces. She also carried the terms of surrender to the British Army, emerging into heavy fire on Moore Street, which only let up because of the white flag she was carrying. Winifred Carney was James Connolly's secretary and confidant. She was the only person present when the general post office was first occupied, armed with a typewriter and a revolver. She was imprisoned for seven months for her role in the Rising. And Constance Markievicz, who kissed her revolver before handing it over to the British Army, and later told the court she was pleased to have caused such disaffection amongst the civil population of His Majesty. So many brave women. We should all be deeply humbled by their courage. And what do men like me owe to them? We're accountable for knowing them, remembering them, learning their stories, and saying their names. It's 2014, and I'm hiring the first member of my team at Facebook. Her name is Ella Mayon Harris, and as we talk, become keenly aware of three things. First, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but she does. Second, I'm going to hire her. There's no question in my mind about this. And third, she's smarter than me, more talented, more driven. She'll be more successful than I ever will. Ella was brilliant, a legend. Within two years, we decided to switch positions so that I became a designer and she became my manager. She was far more successful in this role than I ever was, and later became a director. The lesson here for men is not just to hire women, nor just to promote them, but to actively sponsor them for leadership opportunities, and then to make space so they can take them. It's 2019, and a friend who's a product director tells me that she has always reported to men. In her long career, she has never had a woman manager. And one of the reasons she took this role was simply to help show other women that it's possible to be a product leader. You have to see it to be it, she tells me, quoting Billie Jean King. The representation matters for the next generation. It's 1999, and I'm in the Peace Corps back in Burkina Faso. My manager is a woman. It's 2001, and I work in a small environmental nonprofit in Michigan. My manager is a woman. It's 2003. I moved to a large environmental nonprofit in Washington, D.C. My manager is a woman. It's 2004. I moved to another large environmental nonprofit. My manager is a woman. It's 2008. And I joined the largest consumer cooperative in the United States. My manager is a woman. It's 2013. And I joined the Facebook design team in California. My manager is a woman. It's January of 2020 and I'm talking with Kim Mackenzie Doyle in Dublin. She's the woman who originally commissioned this talk, the talk you're hearing right now. And she tells me that she wants to amplify the voices of successful women so that they can inspire other women to join the field of design and advance further in their own careers. You gotta see it to be it, she tells me. And I believe her, because I've seen it. It's about five minutes ago. I'm telling you about the good place and asking what we owe to each other. But that's in the past. It's already happened. But for me, it's happening again right now. And soon in the future, I'll answer this question. And I'll tell you what we can do to pay down the debt of what we owe. It's January of this year, and I'm conducting an online survey of people in the design industry. I'm asking them to answer questions about the gender equity that they do or don't experience at work and in the design field as a whole. I'm also asking them about their expectations of men. What do they expect? And what do men expect of themselves? 160 people from all over the world take the survey. 
The clear majority of respondents self-identify as women, though just over one quarter are men. They work across the entire design industry. Their broad range of experience spans from those just entering the field to those who are 20 plus year veterans. Likewise, their roles range from entry level to C level executives to founders and more. I ask people to rate their level of satisfaction with the support they've seen from men for women, transgender, and non binary people where they work. And out of 160 people, just 47, or about 29%, are very or extremely satisfied with the support that they have seen. Similarly, I ask people to rate the support they've seen for women, transgender, and non-binary people from men in the design industry as a whole. And out of 160 people, 56, or about 35%, are very or extremely satisfied with the support that they've seen. And this tells us that, at least amongst this group of respondents, more people think the design industry provides better support for women, transgender, and non-binary people than the average workplace does. And in a way, that's good. It implies that maybe if you're in a bad workplace, you can then turn to your professional community for support, and you'll have a better chance of getting it there. But it's also very bad, because this is a poor substitute, and because only about a third of people find their workplaces or professional communities to be supportive enough of people who aren't men. So we clearly have a long way to go, and the way forward is, uh, isn't clear. In fact, it's distinctly unclear. Men are in the majority. We have the ability to change this, to do better. So how should we hold ourselves accountable for doing that? It's early March of 2020. And you may remember that that was the longest march we've ever had. And it's still going on, even now. March never ended. My wife and I are in bed, and we'll be asleep soon. But right now, she's angry. Angry at me. She asked me why I never believe what she says. But I do, I, I do. But she points out how I always show doubt whenever she makes a claim. And damn it, I know that she's right. Let's set this in its proper context. My wife is a PhD biochemist who's now in her second career as a highly successful working artist. And me, I'm some dude with a slide deck. <laughs> and it wouldn't matter if she didn't have these credentials. She deserves to be believed. And so why, why is my first instinct always to ask her, are you sure? It just comes out of me before I realize I've even said it. Has she ever told me this before? I'm not sure, but I think she has. The fault isn't with my memory, though. It's with me. I know I can do better, but I don't know why I keep doing this. So no surprise, but I'm the asshole here. I'm not perfect. I never will be. I've made so many mistakes, and I've hurt people, too. It doesn't matter that I don't intend to. It matters that they were hurt. And I'm so... So sorry. But I can admit that I'm wrong, and I can hold myself accountable for doing better. And that's what I owe to my wife. That's what I've always owed her. But it's also what I owe to myself, trying to become the best version that I can be, a version of myself that doesn't hold her back. Our story as a couple isn't about each of us as individuals. It's about how we work together to solve our problems. It's right now. My wife is in another room, and she knows I was going to tell you this, and I can't see her, but if she can hear me, it's probably safe to say she's blushing. It's January again. People are responding to my survey. I asked them about what we owe to each other, what men can do to better support women, transgender, and non-binary people at work and in the design industry. Let's see what these folks have to say. I've purposefully left off gender so that it's easier to judge these messages based on their merits rather than the messenger. Men can use their position to ensure everyone gets opportunities to challenge themselves. Men can understand their own biases and limitations and make a conscious effort to rise above them. 
men should champion the ideas and roles of women as, mo as much or more than they champion their own ideas and that of men. Men should stop saying, Hi guys, on Slack. Men should keep in mind that your experience is not the only experience. Men should get to know the struggles and barriers of the people they work with. If you find yourself feeling uncomfortable, that means you need to listen more. Men can stop being hostile to my ideas and then telling me, you are getting emotional. In meetings, if you see women getting interrupted, say, hey, what were you going to say? Don't tell us to be more assertive and then punish us for being abrasive. I don't need special treatment. I just need men to look at me as an equal individual. Men should fight for more inclusion and more equality in pay. And finally, men should use their power to level the field and weed out all of the old school conservative political a-holes. That's a direct quote. Now look, none of these are unreasonable and none of them are insurmountable. All of them are achievable. So looking at these as a whole, I'm learning that to improve gender equity in the design community, you don't have to suddenly become a perfect person and solve all the problems at once. All you need to do is make a little progress and then continue from there. And the best way to do that is to get curious about other people's experiences, to listen to their stories. It's 1989 and I'm immersed in a story. I'm reading a comic book, something I still do in 2020. I'm reading Watchmen, a dystopian political fantasy. I can't put it down. Among other things, Watchmen features a character who exists across all of time, experiencing every moment at once. So he talks to people about their past and their future, all in their present. He's a tragic character, losing the people he loves and eventually separating himself from humanity but only after he inadvertently causes the deaths of millions of people due to his carelessness. He has the power to create any sort of change he wants, but he refuses to use it until it's too late. Considering what he could do, he could have done more. The character's superhero name is Dr. Manhattan, but his real name is the same as mine. It's right now, and what men should be accountable for is becoming clearer. Men clearly owe a great debt. The best way for us to start paying it is by acknowledging our privileges, our faults, and the structures we've built to enable ourselves. That's our first step toward dismantling them in favor of something better, fairer, more equitable. I don't want our story as designers to be about every man for himself. I want it to be about how we all work together to solve our problems. So let's get started. I'm going to share seven stories of organizations that have improved their approach to creating gender equity at work, both in design orgs and beyond them. Their goal was never to be perfect. It was just to drive progress and build momentum. It's 2012, and Etsy are struggling to hire engineers who aren't male. And this is a problem, because roughly 80% of Etsy's online marketplace is made up of women. They have this inspiring idea that if their staff looks a little bit more like the people they serve, they'll do a better job of understanding them and serving them. So they offer talented women hacker grants that provide need-based scholarships to enroll in an organization called Hacker School. This is a three-month hands-on course designed to teach people how to become better engineers. A number of studies have shown that all people perform better in math and science if 50% of the participants are women. So gender equity was a key metric that both Etsy and Hacker School greatly valued. You see, the story here isn't just about the women. It's about how women and men both perform better when they're together. Equity benefits everyone. Every time Etsy ran this program, the number of applications by women to their team skyrocketed. And in the summer of 2012, women ended up making over, uh, ended up making up over half of the hacker school classes. Now for Etsy, it was more than worth the investment 
they were able to hire eight women from hacker school, and they quickly reached a point where almost one out of five of their engineers were women. Remember, Etsy did this back in 2012. For comparison, Facebook didn't reach this level of women in their tech positions until nearly six years later. Etsy didn't completely solve the problem, but they made progress. They chose progress over perfection. It's 2016, and one of my recruiting partners at Facebook tells me about a new approach to interviewing called Diverse Slate. You see, what they usually do is hire the very first candidate who makes it all the way through the interview process. But now, they won't hold any interviews at all until a diverse slate of worthy candidates has been assembled. A study in the Wall Street Journal found that individual evaluations lead to poor hiring decisions. Some 51% of employers who considered candidates individually chose an employee who had underperformed relative to the group. But by contrast, only 8% of the employers who considered candidates side by side chose underperformers. The impact shows in Facebook's diversity data, between 2016 to 2019, the percentage of technical roles filled by women grew by 25% in just those three years. But this isn't just about women or minorities. It's the story about how teams perform better when they have a mix of different people. Progress over perfection. It's 2017, and I'm taking part in an interview debrief at Facebook. These debrief meetings happen after a candidate has completed all of their interviews. All of the staff members who interview them get together in a room to talk about the candidate's strengths and weaknesses. Ultimately, they make a decision about whether or not to hire the candidate. But this debrief is a little different, because this time, the recruiter starts off by asking everyone in the room to share any known biases they might have for or against the candidate. Now, your known biases are the things you're conscious of that affect the decisions you make. For example, maybe I'm positively biased uh, toward a candidate because they're from the same city as me, or they work for a company I admire. Or maybe I'm negatively biased against them because they attended a rival school to mine, or maybe they mention they dislike something I care about deeply. Known biases are different from unknown or unconscious biases because, well, you know about them, and they're top of mind for you. But once you get into the habit of interrogating yourself and questioning your biases, you begin to get an idea about the ones you might not have been all that aware of. It's a little like opening a door to a dark room and letting some light in. It shows you the shapes of the furniture inside, even if you can't make out all the details. It helps you make the unknown known. So I brought this practice to Intercom, and now we record our biases as we become aware of them in interviews. We take some time to share them with one another during our debriefs. It's easy, fast, and effective. Here's one from an interview last year, and I mean, really, who doesn't like coffee? Look, it's not perfect. It doesn't uncover all of our biases. It doesn't stop us from making bad decisions. But it helps. It's progress over perfection. It's 2016, and I'm crying in a bathroom stall. I made a big mistake at work, and I let down my team. Facebook has a giant, self-contained campus at their California headquarters, and I just couldn't think of anywhere else to go where it would be safe to cry. It wasn't the first time I'd been there. Crying at work is, well, it's a thing. It happens. And when it does, it's just so real. Several of my colleagues are far braver about it than I was, and they cried in front of me or others. I wish I were that brave, but I'm not perfect. I still have a hard time with this, and I imagine other people do too, especially women who are judged far more harshly for crying at work than men. They're called emotional, or hysterical, or weak. They're told that they can't handle the pressure. But men like me, men who cry, are considered to be brave and passionate about the work. They're empathic leaders who we should model ourselves after. And that's a problem. Our tears should be just as equal as our pay. 
I did some research on this and wrote about the way that gender affects our perspectives of people who cry at work. It made a big impact at Facebook and helped them start a conversation about the value of psychological safety during the emotional moments that we all sometimes feel at work. It didn't solve the problem, but still progress. It's 2019, and Jasmine Friedel, one of our design directors at Intercom, completely redesigns our hiring process for designers in order to reduce the impact of our biases. For example, because of Jasmine, we no longer ask candidates to complete a take-home design exercise. And we don't do this because it's clearly biased against people who don't have time for extra work, like parents, caretakers, people with multiple jobs, and well, pretty much everyone. We also think that people should be paid for any extra work that they do. So instead of a design exercise, we now hold ourselves accountable for having better conversations with our candidates to understand their past work, their design process, and how they work with teams to drive impact. This makes our recruiting process much more effective and far more respectful of our candidates' time. We've also written up our process so our candidates know what to expect in advance. That way, they can make good decisions about how to prepare and whether or not we're even what they're looking for. Setting clear expectations helps people with imposter syndrome find their way toward applying for more roles. And while some studies show that imposter syndrome affects women more than men, others show that it's spread equally amongst the genders. Equity benefits everyone. We are all better together. So we also did this with our internal design process, our career levels and expectations, and several other resources. They're all publicly available at intercom.design. We want our design candidates to see them because we think people do their best work when they know what to expect. So all of these resources aren't cheat sheets. Instead, they give all candidates equal opportunity to show us their strengths. It's progress over perfection. It's 2013. I'm 38 years old, and for the first time in my life, I'm finally learning how to give feedback effectively and without bias. A trainer is walking me and my team through the Situation Behavior Impact Model of Giving Feedback, or SBI. It's pretty simple. You start with the situation. This is the context about where, when, who's involved, and what happened. Then you go to the behavior. This is what you personally observed a person doing. And finally, you end with the impact. That's the result of the person's behavior on you. For example, you might tell me that in our group meeting, I cut you off while you were explaining your idea, which meant that the team didn't take action on it. And once you've delivered feedback this way, you, you can encourage the other person to think about the situation and to understand the impact of his or her behaviors. Give them time to absorb what you've said and then go over specific actions that can help them to improve. It's an effective way of giving feedback because it reduces bias and helps people come to terms with what actually happened. There are entire books about this, but it's really no more complicated than that. It doesn't stop bad things from happening, but it does help people learn from them. It's progress over perfection. It's 2017, and I'm learning that performance reviews are often biased against women. I see a presentation from the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford that tells me this. 60% of women get feedback that their communication is too negative, and 76% of women get feedback that their communication is too aggressive. And a Wall Street Journal study found that, as compared to men, Women get 2.5 times as much feedback about having an aggressive communication style, 2.4 times as many references to team accomplishments versus their own, 50% fewer references to their having vision, 50% fewer references to their technical expertise and skills, and 33% less feedback linked to business outcomes. So it's no wonder that women aren't promoted at the same rates to the same levels of leadership as men. On top of systemic biases, they're also given different feedback. And the feedback they get 
is skewed toward how people perceive them instead of the actual business impact of their work. So a key finding in this research is that men and women tend to use communal language to describe women's performance. These are words like team player, friendly, good with relationships, and committed to the team. But men and women both use what's called agentic language, words that show agency and ownership when they talk about men's performance. And these are words like visionary, influential, risk taker, and independent. So helping each group to understand gender bias in language and how it impacts the perception of performance is a good first step. But a better one would be to help each group strategically use each other's language to actively combat those biases. Progress over perfection. It's 2012, and the writer Kelly Sue DeConnick reinvents the decades-old character of Carol Danvers, more famously known as Captain Marvel. And rather than being a damsel in distress who only furthers the storylines of male characters, this new Carol has agency. She's a three-dimensional person with desires, and dreams who takes ownership over her life. No one tells Carol what to do. She tells them. In an interview, DeConnick says that Carol falls down all the time, but she always gets back up. And we say that about Captain America as well, but he gets back up because it's the right thing to do. Carol? She gets back up because fuck you. If you haven't read comics because of how they've portrayed women in the past, Kelly Sue DeConnick's work like Captain Marvel, Pretty Deadly, and Bitch Planet are all amazing places to start. And I know, I know, a white guy talking about comic books, right? Yeah, I know. But still, I'd urge you to be curious. It's right now, and I'm urging you to be curious. Because that's what I hold men accountable for, curiosity. It's not too much to ask, because after all, if you look like this, you're going through life on easy mode. Curiosity is the lowest possible bar for you to reach. But curiosity is also one of the single most important skills for designers, and that's because it drives our self-awareness, our ability to diverge and converge on new ideas, and it drives our empathy for other people. Jasmine Friedel, that design director colleague I mentioned earlier, she says that curiosity is important in design because when we desire to learn new things or new ways of doing things, we're better problem solvers. We lay out and explore problems before offering solutions. We talk to people instead of answering questions ourselves, and we use evidence over conjecture. So curiosity drives learning. Learning drives progress. And progress creates more equity. It's right now, and you have a choice, a chance, a challenge. If you're a man who's been sitting this one out, not taking an active role because you don't see it as your problem or your fault, well, I'm sorry, Dr. Manhattan, but every man for himself is not going to work. Because the story we tell about the design industry shouldn't just be about men. It should be about how we all work together to solve our problems. It's right now, and being part of the conversation doesn't mean you have to control it, but it does mean that men need to be curious enough to listen and listen enough to learn. It doesn't mean you need to be perfect because, believe me, no one expects you to get this right. So all you need to do is listen, learn, and make progress. It's right now. It's time. Our time. Time to start listening and learning. Because I know what we owe to each other. And I know what I owe to you. Let's progress. Thank you.